Hi, I'm Chloe Okuno. Hi, I'm Benjamin Kirk Nelson. And you're listening to Cinepod, the cinematography podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ben. Hey, Ilya. What's up? What's up? Hey, uh, you missed a really good party this weekend. I know, I know. It's just I, as well. It was a party, but I gotta we give a quick shout out to Scott, who came by Hot Rod Cameras for our 2022 Cinebeer Festival, which was a uh, exclusive affair. We we purposely kept the attendance down, tried to be mostly yeah. outside. Yeah, no, I, I very much wanted to go, and I felt bad. Like Cinebeer is uh, traditionally where we have done a live podcast. We've done it twice. That's right. Uh, we did Fade in Papa Michael and um, Check Over Rase. Oh, Check Over Rase, yeah. Quick shout out though to Scott who came by and said, "Where the hell's Ben?" You know, yeah. <laughs> I really want to meet Ben. Thanks, Scott. Scott, thank you for coming by. It was a lot of fun. I was glad to meet you. Sorry we didn't get to hang out more. Uh, it was kind of a blur. It was a blur of four hours. But. Yeah, I, uh, as the dad of a four-year-old, I was, uh, you know, chasing a boy around Leo Carrillo, Leo Carrillo Beach. You um, know what? There's plenty of worse places to be. Maybe next year I'll bring him to Cinnabier. Ooh, nice. Yeah, start us, uh, you know, exposing a five-year-old to beer early. You're a good parent. Yeah. <laughs> so, Ben, who is on the show today? Well, today we have one of our fine Sundance recordings for a movie called Watcher, which was a big hit at Sundance, and it was directed by Chloe Okuno and shot by Benjamin Kirk, and we have them both on. Wow. All right. And you interviewed them both. I did. I did. It was during Sundance. Sundance interviews tend to be a little bit on the short side, so uh, that's how it rolls. But hey, not every episode has to be four hours long. You know what? More time for us to yak right now, then. Oof. Say, let's let's get into close focus. What is the topical industry zeitgeist of today? Well, uh, this actually comes from our uh, producer, Alana Cody, which was a Deadline article about how Disney Pixar's Lightyear is not going to be playing in a number of countries, including uh, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, lots of parts of the Middle East and Asia. And why? Because apparently there's a same-sex kiss in the movie. Wait a second. Lightyear is animated, so they did not like a kiss between two animated characters of the same gender. Correct, correct. And look, I understand that uh, probably a lot of these countries you're talking about are deeply religious, but I, I would also point out that Disney and Pixar, especially Disney, have uh, mm. had gay coded characters in every movie they've ever made. Like you can really go back and look at uh, Scar in The Lion King, super gay coded. There, there's gay coded characters throughout the whole thing. It's just gay coded characters. Like uh, it, they're okay to be gay coded as long as they're asexual. Is what you're saying? Correct. Yeah, yeah. And and so like I haven't seen Lightyear. I don't think we get past first base here. I don't really think it's a. I don't. Th I, <laughs> that, I don't think that would be a first for for Pixar that, if we got past. That first would base. be weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If if they were gonna do it in anything, it should have been an Inside Out. But no. Um, <laughs> no. I was going to say up because, you know, that that's kind of a euphemism right there anyway. Well, and more than one person has pointed out that Luca, which is also a Pixar movie, is uh, again, I don't know if you would call it gay coded, but a lot of what that movie is about is about living your true self. And it's about mm. two boys. I don't know. I don't think it's a bad message for heterosexual people, but I also think it could be a uh, positive message for gay people and what is wrong with that i don't understand why anyone cares well i understand why disney cares because they want to make those dollars oh, they want oh to yeah. make those dollar bills y'all they want to get them well, from what? china they want to get from the middle east they want to get them from you know <laughs> uh red states well i really do i really do wonder like what's the box office situation in saudi arabia are they giving up that I, much i wouldn't you know, it I don't know. I don't know the answer. That's a great question. I, I, I really have no idea what that box office, you know, this actually reminds me of, <laughs> this reminds me of a, a week ago on the Airy Instagram account, there was controversy mm -hmm. because they changed the Airy logo to uh, Rainbow Stripe and said, uh. hey, you know, we support, support June, you know, uh, Gay Pride Month and Pride Month. And uh, they got tons and tons can't, of, can't of, have that. of feedback from people in the Middle East. Oh, God. 
That's just that's just lame. <laughs> well, I, I encourage those people to use cheap knockoff gear instead of airy gear and see how the, how their movies turn out. I, I, I just. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's like everybody just needs to kind of join the century. I mean, it's weird. But I feel like a lot of this is because uh, Disney caught so much flack as a corporation uh, in Florida for not pushing back against the... Oh, that's the, sure. The, the don't say the, gay. Yeah. And so I feel like, is this a correction for that? Then basically, because according to the Deadline article, they did cut a version where they edited out the kiss and I'm sure that, like, story-wise, it played okay, but Pixar pushed back and said, we want to put it back in. And so Disney, I mean, I don't know, if they were kissing away a million dollars across all of those countries, that's still a million bucks. That's a lot of money. And I bet it's way more than that. It probably is, but there's something to be said about artistic integrity and filmmaker's vision. And, you know, the studio always ends up with Final Cut, or nearly always ends up with Final Cut. But it feels to me that there was a period of time when the auteur really got to say what the movie was going to be about, what was going to happen in the movie, and the people who were releasing it and paying for it just had to decide that they were going on that ride from the beginning. Maybe it's different with kids movies. So maybe it's a much higher dollar potential loss and gross because of that. But, but well, I, but I, I mean, here's the, here's the thing about kids movies. Part of you could say like, let's not sexualize these cartoon characters, but we've been having cartoon characters kiss since time immemorial. It was just always a uh, two straight people kissing um, or, or two mice or, you know, any other sort but, of, but, uh, if, but if they were mice or, you know, yeah. if it's lady in the tramp, it's still a dude and a woman doggy. You can tell by the eyelashes. That's the, you know, that's the, that's the giveaway. Well, I mean, uh, th- there are female dogs. I, it's not anatomically incorrect, but, uh, <laughs> but like if you were to have two girl dogs in lady in the tramp kiss mm-hmm. each other that yeah. back then that would have been the most scandalous thing that ever happened. Oh. But I feel like, do we lead culture? Do we follow? culture i feel like disney or pixar would have had any number of opportunities to say let's not involve this in this story leading up to this moment but they let it go there were somebody right. champion Some, somebody someone was like it should be there it should be there 100 yeah. yeah. and personally i don't think it's a bad thing I, I grew up as did you in a super homophobic time and that time is kind of over, and I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's uh, oh, far from it. Probably a good thing to show that a same-sex kiss that that is a thing that happens in the world, and maybe helps prevent homophobia in the future. And also, as far as like these countries that aren't playing it, how much you want to bet that in most of these countries piracy is rampant to the point where this is actually not going to dissuade anyone from really seeing it. Uh, I think that it's highly likely there's quite a few countries that the piracy is so out of control that it's far more likely that the audience for the movie will see it pirated and not actually have paid a penny for it. Yeah, I mean, I just think that anyone who gets offended by this needs a hobby. That's, I guess that's really what it comes down to. If you're offended by this, you should pick up woodworking or something. And, and you know what? If you're offended by our conversation about this, then you can go listen to another podcast about cinematography. So. Yeah, I don't. I just don't feel like it's a, a controversial thing. I mean, like you know, it and shouldn't also, be controversial at all. And, and, no, and by the way, yeah. like if it offends you religiously to have this in a movie, you can also choose to not watch this movie and vote with your dollars. I think that that's. I don't agree with your point in that case. Not you, but in this hypothetical person's point. But uh, you know, certainly, certainly, but you're right. That that's an absolutely valid way to make your opinion known. A hundred percent. Yeah, vote with your wallet. Anyway, I think that that's about enough of that. Let's get on to the interview. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. I'm here with the director and cinematographer of the Sundance film Watcher. Holy crap. Amazing, amazing thriller feature. Chloe Okuno, director, and Benjamin Kirk, DP. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So to me, this movie kind of lives in an interesting genre of movies. It made me think probably the most of The Invitation, but there are plenty of movies like this where it's a movie about a character that we're, uh, let's just say, an, uh, not an unreliable narrator, but somebody who we're not 100% sure if her suspicions of uh, wrongdoing in her immediate area are correct or not. So it, there's kind of a paranoid thriller aspect to it. Also uh, taking place in Romania, which for me is a very exotic location. Uh, 
location. Could you talk about a little bit about the, you know, the influences that went into it visually and how you kind of constructed the unease, the paranoia that you put us in? I, I will say my wife and I watched it last night and she was on the edge of her seat the whole time. Like it was truly freaking her out. So that's amazing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Great to hear. Yeah. So start, uh, Chloe, if you could, about like what was the genesis of the project? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I got hired to direct this back in 2017, and it was sort of, a, would say, a fairly typical genesis in that I read the script that came through my agency, and I thought it was interesting, and um, I went to go pitch on it along with a few other filmmakers. And such is the nature of independent filmmaking, it just took that long for us to finally mm-hmm. move into production. But when I initially read the script, what I did like about it was that it was so simple, And I think what I wanted to do was to spiritually pay tribute to movies like Rosemary's Baby Mm. and The Tenant and Repulsion, you know, movies that I think people have called it a throwback possibly because we're not really trying to pull the rug out from under you or do any kind of like insane twist. It's more really a psychological thriller in the truest sense of a word where we're just locked onto this one woman's point of view. So I feel like a lot of what Benji and I talked about was just how do we bring Julia's interior world to life? How do we show her emotions visually? And how do we progress the visual language in the movie? You know, so she starts off still fairly isolated and lonely and moving into this new city, but there is a certain sort of romance to it. The fantasy of like being in a new place, lost in translation style. (laughs) Um, But then as her fear escalates, you know, how do you just make the world feel more oppressive and scary? And obviously Benji did the most incredibly beautiful job photographing the movie. I think it's, I think it's some of the best work I've ever seen. I'm biased, but I I also (laughs) really do think his work is just astoundingly beautiful. So... Can you talk about, uh, you know, sort of the visual inspirations? I have to say, while I was watching it, I don't know if I'm way off, but it made me think a little bit of Tak Fujimoto and The Silence of the Lambs and, you know, some of the thriller work around that in that it felt very naturalistic. It didn't feel uh, commented upon necessarily in the cinematography, but it created a sense of dread and there was like a, a depth and a, an interesting use of color and stuff like that that didn't feel overcooked. But like, what were your inspirations? I think the ones that we talked about, I mean, I I love Silence of the Lambs. I love Tuck Fujimoto. We didn't talk about that one so much. I think we talked more about, you know, a lot of David Fincher films like Seven and Gone Girl. I think his color palette and just how he will use the color red to sort of like imprint the sense of terror onto the yeah, film. Yeah. That was a big one. Uh, I, I think I already mentioned the Polanski Apartment trilogy. We looked at Roger Deakins' work in Prisoners and... This movie called Perfect Blue was also something we we looked at a bit, uh, along with Lost in Translation and uh, Kislowski's Three Colors Blue. Am I missing anything, Benji? I feel like we talked about so many movies. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, there's also uh, some some Hitchcock uh, rear window, of course. And uh, yeah, um, from the beginning of the movie, I'm like, am I being rear windowed? I was waiting yeah. to be rear windowed. <laughs> And we also, we talked a little bit about, about Clue, uh, oh. shot by Gordon Willis, like a little bit of the lighting there and also the, the way that that portrays the, the main character. I think we use a little bit from Birth as well, shot by Harris Savinas. It's just the way that it kind of portrays their character in a way that is unshowy, that, that's kind of underlying, uh, but still trying to convey what the main character is feeling or is going through especially with the camera placement and how close physically the camera is to the characters. So you're saying that like when you were shooting a shot of somebody, what lens you would use and how close you would be to the character that you kind of built an arc in in the movie. Yeah. So, so in the beginning we would be on a log of focal length that like we'd be further physically further away. Like we did wide shots on a, on a long lens uh, to kind of uh, emulate mm-hmm. that someone's nice. watching, like having foreground elements and all that. Mm. And then as the story progresses, the general idea was that she felt that the washer is coming closer and closer to her. The camera would also move physically closer, so we would be on a wider lens, but closer to her. This is almost an administrative question, but it's something that fascinates me. How do you keep track of that stuff when you're building your shooting plan? And and I guess, you know, this is a movie that takes place in not that many locations. And, you know, it's not Lord of the Rings or something where you're all over the place. So it might be a little bit easier. But like if you're shooting out of sequence and you know, like you're on page 65 so we want to be on x lens or you're you know you're on page 15 and you want to be on a different lens how do you make sure that you you're kind of modulating that properly 
I would say that it's it's not so much about that from the beginning to the end we have a progression that that is constant. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's more about like reading each scene, and me and Chloe would, would talk about each different like each scene and kind of feel like how is Julia feeling in this scene? How I mean, where is she in this in the story in this? And then when you prep the movie, that's how you kind of plan all the shot that you mm-hmm. that you want to do. And then I mean, of course, you're not shooting in order, but you know, okay, now we're shooting scenes uh, seventy two. It's it's this is where Julia is in this scene. So I think that's what dictates the visual incense. No, it's just something that fascinates me because people have different ways of doing it. And when you're making a movie and you're in the middle of it, it's so easy to get lost and and not and be like, oh yeah, that shot looks cool, and then not realize like, oh wait, at this point we wanted to be on this lens or we wanted to be using these colors or you know whatever. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We probably got lost a few times. <laughs> I don't think it's getting lost though. I feel like that's why. I mean, Benji and I have worked together before. We worked on a short film at AFI together, and. I would say like it even surprised the producers, the extent to which we love to prepare and to shot list. Like we would go off into a room together and shot list every single scene of the movie for hours. And I I almost think they were like, what are you guys doing in there? And I'm like, what do you mean? What are we doing in there? We're making the movie. We're shot listing. (laughs) We're figuring out, we're figuring out what every single choice has to be. So, and Benji is one of the most organized DPs I've ever worked with in terms of just, you know, putting things into shot lister and, you know, making floor plans and knowing exactly what we're doing on the day. So I feel like we have a really good sense of the progression, even if we're shooting out of order. And then it frees us up if, you know, on set, a shot doesn't feel quite right. And even if it doesn't adhere to the visual language, you know, I think like we feel comfortable enough doing it anyway, because sometimes it's about following your instinct as well and just sort of letting your eye guide you and, and see what feels right. But one of the things I, one of the many things I admire about the film is it does feel sort of what you're de- describing. It feels so thought out and so constructed. It feels like, you know, I'm sure you shot coverage and there were different ways that it could have gone in the editing room, but it feels like it was put together the way, that, exactly the way that you had designed it to, to go together. Fincher is a great way to describe it. You know, like I, I had thought about Fincher specifically. There's a hallway. I don't want to spoil it for audiences, but there's a specific hallway and I'm like, oh, this looks like seven right here. And especially in this digital age where you can just roll and roll and roll, there's often a temptation to just kind of make it up on the day or just shoot and shoot and shoot. Uh, talk about the choice to make it more of a of a Hitchcockian thing that's that's very constructed and creating the construction that you did. I mean, I would say for myself personally, I just don't know how to work any other way. I really admire directors who, you know, their approach is sort of more improvisational. But for me, the movie is really built in the conversations that I have with Benji and with the production designer and with the costume designer, you know, what is the color palette story of the film? Like, these are all choices that I feel like have this emotional resonance when you see the final thing. So yeah, that's just how I know how to make movies. And it would be terrifying not going into it with that level of, of planning. Yeah, definitely. And, and also having everything planned out gives us a certain freedom to kind of go a little bit off the plan if, if we find something better on set or if, if we see that the blocking or something is changing the way we should shoot it, then then we have a freedom to change it because we, we prep what the story is really about and what, I mean, what we should get out of each scene. So correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the two of you met at AFI or you've just been working together since uh, AFI. Talk about your collaborative relationship uh, with one another. This is actually the first time I've worked with the same DP twice. (laughs) Um, But I I mean, yeah, Benji and I, we both went to AFI. We were in the same year. Obviously, he was in the cinematography track. I was in the directing track. And we partnered together to do our thesis film, Slut, which, you know, I really enjoyed that experience. I know Benji is an incredible cinematographer. I feel like our process is just talking about the film and the characters and the story and sort of Mm. trying to track some, that's, I mean, sometimes I can get a little ahead of myself and just like we're shot listing. I'm like, okay, it's this, this, this. And then he's like, no, but wait, what is the emotion? What's like, <laughs> let's talk through the, the story of it. And it's good to be reminded of that. But I think that's why, I mean, from my perspective, I think that's why we work together so well, because we've sort of come up with the same philosophy in terms of narrative storytelling. Yeah, I, I totally agree that us being taught this, uh, at AFI, we kind of have a common approach to to form the visual language. We very quickly are on the same page because we kind of speak the same language. Like mm-hmm. we kind of use the same terms when we want to describe something visual. 
And also, I mean, when we were at AFI, I, I also realized how Chloe has a great force to write characters, but also how like to direct the, the characters in her in her movies. And I kind of know where to give her space to kind of do that. And then it's um it's a great way of working, I think. So congratulations for getting into Sundance. And uh, this is possibly one of the weirdest Sundance years ever, except for, I guess, last year. Getting into Sundance is, you know, the brass ring of making a film. It's it's about as awesome as it gets. But being that it's digital and it's being done virtually this year, you know, ordinarily, I, you know, I would be there talking to you in person. What do you think are the benefits and the drawbacks of doing it this way? I mean, and certainly it seems like it could go to a wider audience at the festival. But like, you know, what are your experiences? I would say, obviously, I think every filmmaker wants to show their movie in a theater. That's not a controversial statement. I, I completely, <laughs> completely understand, you know, why they had to move virtually. And I will say, I think they did a really, like, incredible job because, I mean, even my my extended family have all watched this and have been able to watch it. And they, a lot of them, like, you know, are not very technically savvy. So the fact that Suntan yeah. is able to to create like this platform where people can still navigate it pretty easily and it can get out to to a lot of folks, like that's amazing. But I will say, certainly, I hope that this movie will have some sort of theatrical run or at least an opportunity for people to see it in the theater. Because I think it it makes a difference on every film. I would say on this film in particular, it makes a really big difference with the sound design and with Benji's incredible cinematography. I, I just think it deserves to be seen on a big screen. I mean, I agree when I was, I was watching it on a big screen television and, and admiring it, but I just kept thinking like how awesome it would be to be able to see it. There was so much detail and in her neighbor's apartment, there was a bust on a shelf and it just ha made me think about severed heads a lot. <laughs> Every time I saw it in the background, how intentional of a choice was that? The, the bus in the back of Arena's apartment. Yeah. I actually have to say it threw me off the scent because I was like, it made me change who I thought the killer might be because I'm like, oh, there's a head we keep seeing in the background in these shots. Um, yeah, no, it was that. I mean, there was actually another scene that we cut in which there were even more heads. Like Julia goes to buy that little Dracula figure. Yeah, yeah. And we put a bunch of like disembodied mannequin heads on the shelf wearing like hats. <laughs> and I really, I'm sort of, well, I know we, we cut the shot because the scene, you know, was just, we, we needed to sort of pick up the pace a little bit overall, but maybe that'll be included on the DVD extras because it was a nice <laughs> little moment of foreshadowing. That's awesome. Well, cool. I mean, honestly, I feel like that's all I have for uh, the two of you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Before we go, can both of you tell our listeners where people can see your work online or interact with you, social media, website, whatever you have? Uh, I have a Twitter account. If you want to follow my very inane tweets, it's at Kokunosan, C-O-K-U-N-O -O underscore S-A-N. I think that's a bit of it. <laughs> and Benjamin, do you have a, a website, Instagram, whatever? I have an Instagram, it's B underscore Kirk. And also I have a website, benjaminkirk.dk. Um, thank you so much for letting us be a part of this. No, no, thank you and congratulations. And uh, I genuinely loved it. And I, I hope a lot of people get a chance to see it really soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that was Chloe and Ben. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, really enjoyed Watcher. If you get a chance, it just came out. Check it out if you like your uh, horror slash thriller in the uh, paranoid Polanski-ish Rosemary's Baby vein. It's a really, really good film. I can't say enough good about it. That sounds awesome. All right. So, Ben, guess what? Uh, what? <laughs> this is that part of the show that we are paid to talk about something. I am not paid, but go on. <laughs> That's true. You're not paid. Well, I'm going to change that. I've got some leftover beer from the party I'm going to give you for someone who doesn't drink beer. You'll, you'll love it. Yeah, I was like, you can keep your beer. Anyway. Uh... <laughs> All right. So, so Ben, we got to thank our, our fine friends over at DZO. DZO Film, makers of now the Kata Ace lenses, which are the latest version of the Kata lenses, which is C-A-T-T-A. -T -T -A. You can find them and see them stuff all over at Hot Rod Cameras. It's a pair of 
zoom lenses that cover full frame, 35 to 80 millimeters and 70 to 135. And they're very affordably priced and they are a constant T29. They have a full aluminum housing. They're available in PL mount and EF mount interchangeably and uh, are really very high quality and low cost full frame zoom. So people out there who have been looking for a high quality and full frame zoom that is uh, well suited for cameras like, you know, the Red Komodo or maybe the, the Sony FX6, take a look at the Kata Ace Zooms. You will be glad that you did. They are very impressive. And now, short ends. So Ben, it is short end time. What, yeah, what do you got cooking in your obsession of the week? Well, some time ago you brought up Dall E, D-A-L-L hyphen E, which is an AI slash machine learning. Kaze Alatracci, our, our composer, went off on Facebook about people confusing AI and machine learning. But uh, I think AI is just a kind of machine learning. Uh, maybe, someone correct me. Uh, maybe Kaze. Kaze, who actually, as it turns out, is listening to this. Uh, feel free to correct me, Kaze. But anyway, a website called huggingface.co <laughs> has released a free version of of Dolly. So Dolly, basically you type in any text prompt and it will create a uh, visual using machine learning, AI, scouring the web, whatever. And I know for a fact this is going to get more interesting and complicated, but the novelty of this has not yet worn off on me and I've probably done it hundreds of times. So if you go to huggingface.co slash spaces slash Dolly dash mini, you can just on your phone or your computer, you can just input some text and uh, by golly, you'll get something. And it's kind of a nightmare factory. I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, uh, like a lot of my favorite ones that I've personally done are things like, uh, I mean, I started doing stuff with clowns and lobsters. I don't know why those are the two things that most attracted me, but then I was like, James Randi riding a dinosaur. And uh, sure enough, it trialed the internet and made a person who looks kind of like James Randi riding a dinosaur. And they give you like nine different images every time you do it. And it's pretty freaking impressive. And you can do stuff in the style. Like I uh, I did one that was a uh, carrot top as painted by Banksy. And it... it <laughs> It did not understand that I meant the comedian carrot top and not a human body with a, a carrot for a head, which is what that was Dali's editorial uh, choice to make. But uh, there's some some pretty fun ones. My friend Mike Manello put this in my head and he and I have been texting him back and forth like he did one that was Leatherface shopping at Walmart. That's just brilliant. But it's kind of a nonstop. Uh, I, I did uh, Dracula playing chess in Central Park. Yeah, I did a few Stonehenge-related ones. I feel like it taps into everyone's inner surrealist. You know, I was like, Rembrandt uses blood to paint a potato. Like, I did that, and it didn't quite get it, but it gave me several images of Rembrandt and a potato in the style of Rembrandt. It's really good at copying a style. I don't know. I, I did a bunch of different things with lobsters. Yeah, and I, uh, today I was like, Rick Moranis as Batman. Sure enough, it, it'll it'll cook up Rick Moranis as Batman. It's it's a lot of fun, and I I know that it's gonna we're gonna only see more of this kind of thing, and it's only gonna get way better than this. Wow. Uh, yes, it will only get better. Um. <laughs> It's definitely it's definitely a thing. I am on the site right now, and clearly it's uh, spreading like wildfire because this message has appeared several times saying uh, too much traffic. So uh, yeah, you just got to keep trying. It'll it'll eventually go through. Yeah, I, and that's exactly what some people say here. And once your orange square rectangles start moving around, that means it's processing. That means it's it's working. And I do think it's pretty funny that they have a community where uh, you can go and you can see where other people's successful images that were created, like uh, Putin at a rave. So I thought that was... Yeah, I did. Uh, I think maybe my favorite one that I've done so far was Reanimator on The Muppet Show. Oh. And it, and it like literally made up pictures of uh, Jeffrey Combs as Reanimator, like next to a very confused looking Elmo. Um, <laughs> it, it, it is it, very it, much Uncanny Valley, though. I'll tell you that uh, the images that are coming up are not good images right now. These are this is. A, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I, I would say uh, not, it's not even uncanny. It's more uncanny than Valley. It's it's uh, <laughs> it's it's it, uh, it is. It, it is more like Uncanny Grand Canyon. Yes. Uh, but but it's like part of that's what helps make it nightmare fuel. I did one that was uh, Tom Hanks with lobster claws for hands. 
And like, I didn't even need the lobster claws to make it look horrific. Like just the pictures of Tom Hanks look like a cross between Tom Hanks and like the weird creatures in Jacob's ladder. <laughs> that, that's, that sounds crazy. But I assume that like this many people taking an interest in this and using it means that it's just going to keep getting better and better. And, you know, uh, some people are are like, well, then what's going to happen to artists? And I'm like, artists, you're, you're going to be just fine. Artists like, you know, I don't I don't think this takes the place of art. Your, your mention now of the lobster claws for hands uh, reminds me of Jason Bateman and Thunder Force. I don't know if you saw that where he plays the I crab. Oh, yeah. It, that, oh, that. <laughs> oh, wait, I did see that. <laughs> Yes, uh, it's uh, it, it's quite a movie, Thunder Force, and uh, Jason Bateman, I think, pretty much steals the show. He steals everything. Oh, I also <laughs> did a Da Vinci painting of Ninja Turtles, and it really did create pictures of the Ninja Turtles in the style of Da Vinci. Mm, all right. Not, not too bad. Kind I, of interesting. I put in Cartoon Squid, which is, frankly, not challenging at all, but it came up with several cartoon looking squids and I, I gotta say that the last one number nine is like it's pretty respectable pretty respectable yeah, looking squid sometimes I'm surprised at what it won't get like I did the last supper with robots mm. and it just kind of created a bunch of last supper looking images where you can't really make out anyone's face and I'm like that's not the last supper with robots uh, I, I wonder what robot Jesus would turn up let's try it give it a shot so while that's cooking, Ilya, why don't you tell me what your short end this week is? Ah, well, my short end this week is a bit of technology. It is actually a new lens from Lawa. It is the 24 millimeter T14 2X Macro Paraprobe. Boy, it just rolls off the tongue. It's a lot of words, but it is pretty Paraprobe amazing. Paraprobe sounds like, sounds like a medical procedure I need to have done at about my age. <laughs> That's right. Uh, it's time for your Paraprobe. Uh, but oh, the, the reality of this is is it's actually it's, it's really cool, and we just got our, our demo unit in it over at Hot Rod. And if a lot of people remember the original probe lens from Lawa, which was a T14 and had some LEDs around the front, and it was very, very inexpensive. It was a sub $2,000 lens that tons of people bought because they wanted to do tabletop work and all kinds of stuff. The Paraprobe, no pun intended, adds a new twist on this in which you now have a 90 degree rotated front optical piece. So you're now shooting uh, to the left or to the right or up or down, whichever way you rotate this. It's not pointing out the front like a traditional lens. It's now 90 degrees, which creates all kinds of opportunities to fit inside of places and do things you might not have been able to do before and to very easily shoot upwards while having your camera facing forward. Some really interesting stuff like that, including also like low angle prism shots, which are a stalwart of uh, all kinds of different productions in which a lens is pointing downwards, but because of the low an angle prism, now it is pointing forwards or backwards or whichever way you want. And you can get really, really low to the ground, much lower than you could if you just put the camera on the ground. Now you're literally, you know, millimeters above the, the surface. But in addition to all that, this probe lens also has a twisting function where you can rotate the entire image. You can rotate the the direction of the paraprobe and that is sort of like a super super high-end trickery that you'd usually only see reserved on extremely expensive lenses but they give you the ability to rotate that internal prism so you can create a 360 degree uh you know round around shot and uh, i have a feeling that this is going to get used a lot I think it, it's coming in a little bit more expensive than the uh, than the previous one. I think it comes in about twenty five hundred bucks. And uh, if you're in Los Angeles and you want to check it out, we have it over at Hot Rod Cameras now. We now have our, our first demo. But man, uh, it's available in PL mount and a bunch of other mounts and things, and it's freaking cool. There's videos on the web now that show how this thing is using. It is the, specifically from their their Cine line, and it's an original lens that was not previously a uh, you know a, a still lens. It's uh, it's made for cinema, which is which is cool. And I was going to ask, is it anything like the Fraser lens? Is the Fraser lens still around? It is, but it's like you can own this lens for what it costs to rent the Fraser lens for a day or for a couple of days. But I mean, like, is the effect that you're getting similar to that of a Fraser lens? Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't quite have all of the same sort of points of articulation, but in general sense, yes, 100%. And it covers full frame. So for those of you out there who are into full frame, this lens does that. Very, very sweet. Yeah, it's a pretty cool, pretty big deal. 90 degrees. Oh, also partially waterproof, like a, like there are previous ones. So you want to stick it in a fish tank? Yeah, that that's really darn cool. I mean, why? what lens haven't I wanted to stick in a fish tank? 
<laughs> you know, there are some people out there who uh, really do want to get underwater shots and don't necessarily have a way to do it. Well, this uh, paraprobe gives you gives you a, a methodology, which is which is cool. Well, that might be cool for uh, you know, like uh, underwater uh, documentaries. Also, it's a macro, so you can get ridiculously close. So if you want to shoot that algae or if you want to do almost anything, uh, you know, on land, underwater, uh, within the the distance of the, the periscope itself, which I think is about a foot. So, yeah, you got you got some options and you can move it all around. And uh, it's a speedy, you know, uh, T-14. So, uh, you know, have, have some lights ready. <laughs> <laughs> Same problem with the Fraser lens, as I recall. Like it, it was, it needed so much light to get an image. But I, I remember you would be able to get like basically just infinite depth of field out of that, out of that thing. There, there is a focal reducer uh, that I can understand too. So if you don't need full frame, you can put that on the back of it. This I believe it costs about a thousand dollars, and you can get an extra stop of light, which for high speed and probe lens situations is nothing to sneeze at. That's actually that's that's really handy. Well, very cool. So I think that about wraps us up. Ilya, uh, who should we thank this week? I don't know. Do, do we really want to thank people? Do we? Do we should we thank anyone? No. no maybe. Meh. So, yeah. I, what what I do they like really do? It's, it's really you and me doing everything. Yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're the whole show, man. We're composing the music. We're finding the guests. We're editing every second of this. It's just you and me against the world. Oh, oh man. <laughs> and we're doing it super late at night tonight. <laughs> so. Yeah, We're clearly a little bit punchy. So. I'm 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 always punchy. Anyway, um, let's actually let's. Where can people find you? We'll go back to the the thanks in a second. Uh, where can oh, people yeah. find you? People can find me at benrock.com. Mm. Not telling that story again, but I now am the proud owner of benrock.com. And if you want to see, look the at you telling that, that story. <laughs> I'm not doing it. But if you want to go check out my work, go to benrock.com. All my social media and stuff is on there. People uh, keep adding me on the Facebook or the link. The links in, I believe, is the correct uh, plural of LinkedIn's. Really? Um, no. <laughs> okay. I'm making, I'm the making it up. Is the past tense of linked. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, feel free to say hi uh, wherever I am. I'll I'll definitely reach out. It's it's always good talking to people who listen to the show. Ilya, where can people find you? Well, you know, actually, uh, I really haven't been using Instagram much, but a couple people found me on Instagram and had some messages that were, my apologies, sitting there for about four weeks. So (laughs) thanks for uh, your patience and me getting back to you very, very tardy. But yeah, I'm going to try and be a little bit better. Uh, I guess I don't have the notifications turned on for Instagram or something because I didn't think people are going to reach out to me, but find me on the Instagram at Ilya Friedman. I'm there. And of course, Monday through Friday, I'm usually at Hot Rod Cameras uh, where I'm helping people build out their sound stages and, uh, you know, buying new uh, airy cameras and all kinds of stuff like that. Buying ear- airy gear despite their embracing of the LGBTQ community. Well, you know, I'd say that they're acting like a strong ally and they're putting it out there and it didn't just feel like corporate speak. They really, you know, but uh, yes, that, that did offend some people. So. You know, I guess to that, those people, that. I say uh, stop watching movies written by, directed by, starring, uh, shot by, or involving anyone in the LGBTQ community. Like, you know, <laughs> if, if you're gonna if you're gonna be like that, yeah, and enjoy that movie that's left. Yeah, <laughs> both of them <laughs> for real. Yeah, that's it. Anyway, so Ilya, who should we thank? Let's thank Ben Katz, who certainly didn't have an easy job. Not he today, just, he, did. he just sent me an invoice, so I got, I got to pay Ben Katz, and boy, we, we made him work. So thanks, Ben. Making him work hard for that money. Uh, let's thank Kay's Alatraxi, who has composed every scrap of music that you've heard on this entire show, and uh, who also is available to uh, color grade your, your film, and to direct it, and to do CGI on it. That guy does, does everything. It's kind of shocking. And, and he makes pizza. He, did, he makes a hell of a pizza. And <laughs> dances. I, I can't uh, speak to the dancing. Okay. Well, I hear that a, a large computer manufacturer can because they, they paid him money to do it in Vegas. So. Oh, oh yeah, that is true. That is true. Anyway, and then uh, lastly but never leastly, let us thank Alana Cody. Alana, who uh, keeps lining up amazing interviews. You and I did one today that I, uh, I, I dare wait. say was it, it was a dream come true for both of us. It, it was so uh, much fun. It was really, really yeah. good. All right, so Ben, uh, I think that does it. I think we said all the things that we're supposed to say. Excellent. Well, we will see you here next week. Thanks for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. 
Thanks for listening. 